You bad decision makers out there, it's Jim Banks here. We've managed to get to episode number 10, and my guest today is Dave Roth. Dave has been a friend of mine for a, an awful long time, I, I guess probably 20-odd years. I've got a bit of a confession, actually. When I first met you, Dave, the jury was out because you were very corporate, and I was like, mm, I'm not really sure. But we've become very good friends since then, uh, so much so that he uh, he let me sleep in his yurt. Anyone that's watched the Tim Ash episode or listen to the Tim Ash episode, you'll hear me talk about a dinner I had with Tim and Dave, and it just seemed only fitting to have Dave on as well as having Tim, I think, in episode six. So Dave, welcome to today's episode. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. So happy to be here. I know this has been sort of a long time coming, so I'm happy to be episode 10. That's quite an honor. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. I was going through my Instagram yesterday, and I was having a look, and one of the posts that I've got on Instagram, I posted a picture of the Eiffel Tower in Vegas next to the Paris Hotel with the Bellagio Fountain. Mm-hmm. And I put hashtag BDWJB coming soon. And that was in January of 2015. So that was nine years ago that yeah. the, the hashtag existed. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously delighted to get to episode 10. I've, I've actually heard that most people that set up a podcast bail out after three or four episodes. So it's testimony to the quality of the guests that I've been able to have on so far. And I'm delighted to have you as a guest on today. So today, tell us a little bit about your career in the industry to date. Sure. Yeah. So I was thinking, as you said that, Jim, that nine years, I I can't even imagine how many bad decisions we've collectively all made in the past nine years. I would would take a number of episodes just to get to that. Absolutely. Yeah. uh, Yeah. I've so I've been doing this a long time, just like you. And when we got into it, it was we didn't know what to call it. It wasn't called digital marketing. It was like that search engine thing that we were doing. And got into it, like most of us did, almost accidentally, like happened to be doing something with an internet startup in like 2000. And it had to do with search engine indexing of valuable content. And I think the, the seminal moment was like in 2004, which is now almost exactly 20 years ago when the Google AdWords auction marketplace launched. And that's, that was really the moment I think for a lot of us, because that's when the industry took off and that's where instead of us going to look for jobs, the jobs started to come look for us. And so that was a great run. Uh, I worked in the agency business first in San Francisco and in Denver. And then I spent about a decade in Silicon Valley working in-house at some big brands, namely like Yahoo and Realtor.com. And when I got to Yahoo in 2006, I think it was the third biggest website on the internet behind MSN and AOL. And we were serving up, I think, 3 billion page views a day on Yahoo worldwide. So it was a big deal. And I was running all of our outbound search engine marketing on behalf of the Yahoo properties. And so there was some, I mean, there was a lot of bad decisions there. I had six or seven years at Yahoo navigating corporate waters. And that's about the time that we probably met because back in those days, I would wear a suit to the conferences when I presented like a proper, like a proper. I remember that. I remember we used to go and, and we would both be speaking at PubCon. And I remember always seeing you in the speaker's room wanting to come and talk to you. But one, I was like, oh, he's wearing a shirt and tie. I'm not really sure about that. So that was the first kind of like red flag to me. And secondly, you were always on conference calls. It just seemed like every single time I looked at you, you were deep in the weeds on a conference call of some description, right? You had your headphones on and you were just like really deep in the weeds with a conversation. Yeah, and 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 for me, like I said, it's it took a probably a little while after that for us to really sort of yeah. get into our stride and, and become good friends. So how did you find working in a fairly fledgling industry for probably, as you say, one of the maybe second or third biggest companies in the industry at that particular point in time? How was it for you at that point? Yeah, it was really, it was wonderful and it was strange. It was really difficult and it was really interesting, like all of those things at once. I got there and the people in the central marketing team after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, asked for kind of a rundown on all the business units and what they needed. And I basically showed them like what all the Yahoo properties were doing as far as their own search marketing, how none of them were really united or unified in any way. And I pointed to a particular group of properties that had really, really big 
surge programs like $35, $40 million a year uh, that they were spending on search. And I highlighted those areas as this is where our risk is because there's a ton of money going through these channels and there's not really any infrastructure to speak of. There's like a developer and he's got a machine and he's pushing bid updates to Google and without any QA or anything like that. And they said, great, so that is going to be your responsibility now. And so they gave me that to manage in a in a matrix organization where I had no authority really to speak of other than the, the backing of, of my management, right? So that was really, really challenging. And as somebody who was new to corporate environments, even in tech, it was, there was a lot to learn. There were a lot of bad decisions made. There were a lot of mistakes, but in the course of it, I learned how to be a really good digital marketer and, and how to navigate corporate landscape, which is its own set of issues, right? So, so obviously you, you spent some, some time at Yahoo and Realtor, um, and then obviously you progressed and, and moved and eventually sort of set up your own shop now, which, mm -hmm. which is Emergent dig Digital. Um, and when did you actually start Emergent Digital? I broke free from Silicon Valley about 10 years ago. So it was about 2014, roughly. And the the reason that I had decided to do it was because the I was at Realtor.com, had a great team, had teams of people doing SEO and analytics and mobile and search and everything that we could get our hands on. And we were driving all these leads to realtors across the country. And we were doing a really good job, I think. Thousands of leads a week, a month, just kind of 24-7 and that's how Realtor.com made a lot of their money was by selling leads to, to agents. And, and long story short, I woke up one day and I realized that I really didn't care if we sent another lead to another real estate agent ever again. It just wasn't, didn't have any personal meaning to me. And so that's when I decided to go out on my own and try to do work that I wanted to do with clients that I wanted to work with. And so that was sort of the, that was the impetus behind the creation of Emergent Digital. So tell us, t tell me a little bit more about Emergent Digital, because again, I think unlike a lot of agencies, you, you, you do mul multifaceted kind of uh, campaign management, uh, both on the organic and pay side of things, but you focus on specific types of business. Yeah. Type so of business in was. terms of the types of media that we focus on, they're what we call like the bread and butter channels that have always, it's the reason I, I stuck with digital marketing and search marketing in particular is because you're very close to the revenue dollar, right? So high ROI, optimizable, accountable types of media like um, search and social media, paid and organic. So things that you can readily draw a line to the revenue that they're um, producing. And so I, I set out to leverage those channels and to serve industries that I had a kind of a more personal interest in. So started working for nonprofits, healthcare, education, uh, shared economy, uh, green energy, areas like that were, they were our primary focus going out and started with consulting gigs and then ended up getting more kind of media management projects from clients. And then that kind of evolved into a point where it started hiring people and building teams. And then uh, honestly, we, we brought in our scope beyond just that sort of core set of industries as one does to grow a business. But that's sort of where the ethos of what we're doing, we're, we're trying to do good work for good companies and in, in organizations that have what I would call an ulterior motive. That is that they're, they're on, they exist for some purpose other than just making money. And not that there's anything wrong with making money, but I found that that was one of the things that was missing for me personally was that some tangible outcome of the marketing efforts being satisfying in some way. So that was really kind of what we set out to do and, and what we've done. It's, it's funny, like you mentioned that at the beginning of the, uh, the types of companies you work with startups. And for me, like I, I always remember one of the, the very bad decisions I made was working with some startups because, yeah. and I, I soon got to the point where I'm like, I don't want to work with startups. I think one of the challenges I had, or one of the many challenges I had working with startups is I tend to find that they felt themselves very entitled. Um, and really, I mean, they were no, in no way near that position to be able to do that. So they yeah. put, put you under a lot of pressure because obviously yeah. they, they raise money. They then have to spend the money. They have to hit a certain uh, number in order to get the next tranche yeah. of money. So you were constantly under 
pressure to deliver probably above the capabilities of the, the business to be able to sustain it, right? Yeah. So if you're doing lead generation or, I mean, I worked, I worked with a startup that was doing sort of meal delivery service and it, it got to the point where we, we generated significantly greater numbers. I mean, I think we took their paid media spend from 25 grand a month to 300 grand a month, yeah. Yeah. right? But their fees went up proportionately, right? Because obviously the fees were tied to the, the, the spend, mm -hmm. right? So it got to the point where the clients were unhappy with the spend with the fee attached to the spend, delighted with the results, but unhappy with the fee. And they expected us to reduce the fee. And we're like, well, that was all very transparent at the very beginning, mm -hmm. right? So in the end, we ended up losing the account, yeah. not because we did a bad job of delivering good results. It was just because they had an expectation that they, that they were going to be able to get, you know, 10x the number of, of leads or sales without necessarily having an increase in the cost of the um the solution for us to actually provide the service and i'm yeah. just curious kind of what your what your thoughts were with with working with startups like yeah. now versus when you first started yeah definitely yeah in spite of the fact that you told them it was going to happen yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll start we could do a whole show on on serving servicing startups we have worked for a lot of startups and it's really it's very risky they they don't all make it and sometimes even if they do make it, they change course and leave you behind. So there's a lot of risk. The, the good thing about startups for us is it's really easy to plug into a startup because they have a marketing department that looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. It's got so many holes in it. And they've Assuming got- that they even have a marketing department. Yeah, sometimes it's just like one person in a budget and they all have very aggressive growth targets. So it's easy enough to say like, hey, why don't, you know, hey, Client prospect, why don't you tell me a few things that you would like to be doing, but you either don't have the time, resources, or expertise? And then they name a few things and you say, okay, well, how? And so they always compare themselves to the big unicorn that may exist in the same vertical that they happen to be in and expect themselves to be able to be like that, like right out the gates. Yeah. And again, just in, in realistic terms, just never happens. Yeah. So the, so they're, e they're relatively easy to sign in that regard because. You can just say, well, how about if we started doing those things for you tomorrow that you don't have time for them to do? And we're very nimble, so it's easy enough to say and do that. And so getting startups to sign on hasn't been the hard part. Keeping them is, is usually the hard part for a number of reasons. And as you point out, it's very often the case that those reasons are external to your control. So you have to know working with startups that you're going to lose some of them. We... We lost one in one day. We got fired on our first day with a startup one time. <laughs> that was something else. We we signed up and we said, okay, we're we're ready to get going. Okay, great, get started. And then they wanted to know what we were going to do on the first day. And so I said, well, we're, we're going to look at a lot of things on the first day. We're not going to like produce anything. We're, we're just going to start auditing your accounts. But then they wanted, they wanted, production on day one. So they wanted like an ad copy overhaul. Okay. So we started working on some ad copy. And then by the end of the day, the client said, okay, we're moving in a different direction. We're not going to work with you guys. At least it was a day and you, you exactly. You kind of go at least, at least I felt lucky that it was one day. If it had been a month of that and then they'd fired us, it would have been much worse. I mean, that's the other thing uh, as an agency you have to be really conscious of is that you're we're upside down for the first few months. It takes an yeah. incredible amount of work to to launch with a client in an intelligent, strategic kind of way. It takes a ton, a ton of work. And so it's not until probably month four that you can really expect to, to turn a profit on a client at all. And, yeah, and, and, and really, I mean, like, more risky, right? Yeah, and, and I, I've always said, I'm, I'm more than happy to be a performance-based digital marketing agency and and back myself to get good results and yeah. throw a, an element of my compensation with the client to the results that we were able to achieve. Yeah. But at the same time, I expect there to be a period of grace, if you like, at the beginning. Usually I call it the the kind of the, the Goldilocks period, 90 days to, to begin mm -hmm. with, where I'll, I'll actually say, we're going to work on a fixed fee initially while we work out what some of these key metrics for your specific business are in terms of, they may say, well, I want to get leads at $50 
And realistically, they should be getting leads at eighty dollars. And there's no point in trying to set up a you know campaigns to deliver results at fifty if eighty is the, the kind of more realistic number. And it's only with with putting rubber on the road that you're able to see whether that is actually the case or not. And then from there, you can then benchmark and, and understand to what extent the deliverable can, is achievable. And then once you set that number at the end of the 90-day period, it's something that everyone will feel more committed to because it's, some, it's based on real data rather than just supposition. Yep. And, yep. and I was wondering if you, if you did something similar to uh, Emergent to, to that effect or not. Well, often we'll put in just a three-month minimum to start, right? That's the easy thing to do. Performance-based deals can be really tricky because like with any negotiation, if you do a good job, everyone's unhappy with the results. So so the, I think what you risk with a performance-based deal is either you or the client at some point saying, this is not a good deal for me. But then you can always yeah. renegotiate it. Like, I mean, we're a big proponent of like, let's price it in a way that makes sense for the client, right? If, if they want to know what their exposure is month to month, we can do a retainer. If they want us to be incented to scale, we can do a percentage or a, or a, like a, like you're talking about where you actually have like a, a, essentially you're selling the leads to the client, right? If you do like a a cap CPA kind of a deal. So those can all, I mean, obviously running an agency. And, mm-hmm. and obviously running an agency, you have overheads. I mean, obviously you've got your, your people, right? Mm-hmm. But more often than not, you've also got the, the tools of the trade that you may pay for to run your business. Oh, yeah. And those are things that you're going to be paying for regardless of whether oh, yeah. they spend a dime or, or a, a ton of money, right? And yeah, sometimes- we, pay, you know, we pay for a number of tools. We pay a, probably a relatively large amount of money to get all of our reporting data straight and to be able to push it out to our clients that's expensive to do in terms of time and money so there's a lot of overhead and then there's a lot of and then there's a lot of services that just get poured in but at the inception of of an engagement there's one one and and, and i think i think obviously your your experience in corporate right makes you think differently again i came from a kind of an insurance background. I, I was really well trained as a sort of insurance professional and as a sales manager, right? So I have a very good understanding of how businesses should be run, knew my way around a balance sheet and everything else. And I think one of the challenges that you see now, I mean, again, there are so many agencies coming in, brand spanking new, just starting up, flashy website, nice domain name, mm-hmm. right? And they've got no real world business experience to be able right. to go out and talk to clients in a, in a more sort of realistic way about what some of the challenges and pitfalls may well be, right? And and again, they don't factor in things like the the cost of the tools and everything else, right? Mm-hmm. They'll they'll just spend time. They'll produce really poor poor reporting. They'll probably use Google Sheets. Not nothing. There's anything wrong with Google Sheets, but it's like it's it's not cost effective and not good use of time to actually do the reporting in that way. And I think I think a lot of people. Again, the, the clients are disappointed with the results because the results are not presented to them in a way that's easy to understand. I, I definitely think that my time in-house has served me well to go out into the agency world because now we're working with customers who used to be us, right? So I used to be that. I used to be the guy who hired the agency. So when I'm on the other side of the table, it's really easy for me to relate to the person on the other side of the relationship, it's really easy for me to say, oh, I get your, I understand your planning cycles. I understand why you don't have a budget for this year and it's already January 21st, right? It's easy for me to understand why it's hard for you to put that tracking pixel on the website. These are things that I've lived through and the frustrations that I've had as an in-house resource. And so I found it's really helpful for me to just relate my understanding of that to clients. It puts them at ease, helps them know that we understand their problems. I I remember when I worked um, in-house with uh, Cheap Flights for a few years, they worked on a, it always seemed like a bit of an oxymoron to me. They they worked on a sprint cycle Mm -hmm. and the sprints typically took uh, six weeks to three months. That's not a sprint, that's a a marathon. (laughs) Exactly. And And it was always one of those things that I think before I'd even taken my jacket off the first day, I managed to save them about $150,000 a year on a bid management tool that they were paying for that really was ineffective. And I basically said to them, look, 
why don't you let me run my strategy through one of the accounts we had, I think at the time, six accounts, and we ended up with 13 accounts in, in, in terms of 13 different territories. I said, let me try or prove my strategy works on one of these accounts. And obviously, if it doesn't, we'll just plug the bid management tool back in. They called it the life support machine. We'll plug the life support machine back in. And literally, we went from minus 15% ROAS on a daily basis to plus 15% ROAS instantaneously just by adopting this alternative strategy right so and that was like literally that was before i'd even taken my jacket off right i'd made that decision right one of the first things i did was i went into every account they had something like one and a half million keywords in every single account and to download the account every morning into google ads editor used to take about an hour and 20 minutes right and i said look why don't we just do this why don't we look at every keyword in the last 90 days that's never had a click never had impression and we'll delete them, right? So I, I think I, I I did it with one account. We went from one and a half million keywords down to about, I think it was like 85,000 keywords that we were left with, yeah. right? And everyone, everyone was freaking out saying, we can't do that. All these keywords are really important. I'm like, well, if they were really important, they would have had clicks and impressions. They haven't had any, which tells me that, that Google is basically saying, I found another way to serve up that that search result, it might be a different keyword, different match type, whatever it might be. Yeah. And again, if you look at it now, I mean, I look into some of the accounts that, that when we do an audit, they have, again, hundreds of thousands of keywords. And in today's day and age with broad match terms, I mean, they shouldn't, shouldn't be that many keywords, right? It just doesn't make any right. sense to me. Yeah. There's a lot of, you, when you go in, and we've, frankly, we've gotten a lot of business that way too. Like it's, it's not that hard to go into an existing account and find problems with it, right? So the converse yeah, is it's funny, also, right? So we've also lost clients that way too. Yeah, and and it's funny. Like I I, I always remember when I was working with a, with a friend of mine who ran an agency, and he had like a chief revenue officer. So this guy was responsible for bringing in the money, right? Which was great. And he had a couple of salespeople. I remember him talking to me one day, and he said, "Jim, we we've just landed. We we got a ten thousand dollar audit for this new account that we're going to work with and i need you to do a, a sort of ppc audit for their account right and i'm like okay well i need the login I, we need went through the process of of saying well we, this is what we need to do to get access to their account blah 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 and he said to me oh they don't have an account <laughs> i'm like well how can i do an audit on something that doesn't exist <laughs> and he just said to me, okay. <laughs> so again chief revenue officer he goes You'll figure something out. So, yeah. I mean, his job is to, is to get the ten thousand dollars, and your job is to figure out what to do for it, right? Yeah. What? So, so again, I mean, I I think I I I ended up. I think I did sort of two or three days of like intensive workshop based stuff of training, work, working with their 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 team. So as we were building out the new campaigns and ads and everything else, I was like doing an over the shoulder, like showing them how it worked, right? Because again, I, I think it's quite good and useful if you work collaboratively with your clients to actually show them just how difficult some of this stuff is, but also think, think explaining the kind of process of how you arrive at the decision, why certain things should be in the, the kind of the ad copy and landing pages, what they should have on them and all those sorts of things. Because right? again, I think so many people just think, oh, it's, it's buying keywords is really easy. I mean, I can get a credit card out. I used to say before she passed away, I could, I could give my mom a credit card and she could set up a Google ads account in about 10 minutes, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that she'd be any good at it, but she could definitely set up an account in five minutes, 10 minutes, right? And she could probably start spending money in that time as well, right? So will it be any good? Probably not. Will they get some conversions? Possibly, right? But I think the reality of it is, is that as you know yourself from doing this for a long time, there is a, there is like a lot of science to to what goes on right it's not as simple as it may is as it may appear at the, the kind of first instance I, I i was spending some time with a friend of mine and we had worked together at a little search shop sort of in the beginning of of things and he went on to do other completely different work and and i was at his house and i said you want to see something why don't you come look at what a google ads account looks like now and he looked at it and he honestly, he didn't even know what he was looking at. Like it's so much different and it's gotten so much more complicated, like orders of magnitude more complex than it was. It used to be just, you know, you get some keywords, you buy them, you make some money, you go home and it's, uh, it's, it's anything, it couldn't be further from the truth now.
right? I mean, it, yeah. how, how much? And, and, I think, and I think one of the things that scares me the most doing what I do, so again, I mean, I mean, I run an agency, I work with clients, I get paid by clients. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be selfish and say, well, yeah, all, all clients should work with, if they, if they have the budget, they should work with agencies because agencies will put far more money on the table than they'll ever take off it. Yeah. A good agency will always do that. But what I'm seeing now is that because of the onset of AI and the the way that the kind of the algorithms are changing, the doors are like shutting down. I think, again, I think when you think of things like driverless cars, if I sat in a car and there was nobody in the driver's seat and it was just steering, that would freak me out immensely, right? I'd be wanting to go and grab the wheel and turn it and everything else, right? But it's, I think sometimes you've got, you just have to trust that the, that the, the machine is kind of like, is, is, going to do a good job right yes. i'm i'm not convinced that the ai that meta and google and microsoft is using is delivering absolutely the best results but it's it's getting there and i think for me the challenge is that again like google meta microsoft will all say you don't need to work with an agency because this just kind of like runs itself and as you you pointed out there it just doesn't it's not that way and i'm just concerned that more and more clients are going to take their PPC and their paid social in-house, yeah. right? Because they think they'll be saving money and they'll get great results and they, and it's going to be carnage. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dave? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I do think that there has been a more general trend towards moving things in-house, particularly with bigger clients, right? With bigger brands. Um, but for us, obviously us being an agency, we're always looking for things we can do to add value. So to us, our job has just changed, right? And for the last few years, we've had in our in our pitch deck, like, hey, we leverage machine learning and AI. We use machines to do what machines are good at. And we use people to do what people are good at. And up until now, that's worked okay. I do think that there is a tendency now for, for brands to think like, oh yeah, we can just do it ourselves. So if you think about that piece of it, so what we like to hand, let the machines do is optimize, right? Like we like to let the machines look at all the data and try to figure out what is the best way to get another sale, right? Based on everything that we've set up. So our attention has shifted to the setup and the architecture setting up testing frameworks that will help you understand like what's working and what's not working so you can do more of what is and feed the machines that way. It's also expanded a lot vertically. So we spent a lot more time looking at landing pages and conversion rate optimization, as well as looking at what we call down funnel optimization. So like in the lead gen space, that would be like offline conversions and things like that. So we've really had to as a result of exactly what you're talking about, we've had to expand both horizontally and vertically in terms of what we deliver to clients so that we can continue to deliver value. So I think number one, you're absolutely right. And, and number two, it means that agencies have to reinvent themselves to some degree. But as in this industry, all of us who do this are people who reinvent themselves from time to time right? Like to become a podcaster or whatever it is. So it's, it, it's, it's complicated. It's getting, it's challenging. It's getting more challenging. Those trends will not stop. This business gets harder every year. There are very low barriers to entry and there's not like the other thing that I notice that you see is that there's not one way to do anything that we do, right? So everyone's got their own flavor, their own recipe, their own secret sauce, or maybe not so secret sauce. But yeah. but it, it means that you have to you have to find a way to differentiate, and not everybody's going to implement it the same way in order to find success. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, again, I think you you see people saying, "Oh, the best way to set up a Meta Ads account is to have two campaigns and this them of ad sets and blah 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 blah." It's like everyone's going to be different, yeah. right? Everyone's going to, they're all selling different things. They're selling to them at different price points, right? They've got different websites, as you say. I mean, if their website's horribly slow and janky and doesn't look very good and everything else, they're going to have to try so much harder to get their ads to convert, right? Because the experience from the click through to the you know, landing page is going to be a poor one, right? So instead of it converting at, say, 
5%, it might only convert at 1%, in which case you've got to be five times as good on your ads, right, to get the same amount of money at the end of the day. And I think, again, I think so many people think that because everything's gone down this AI route, all of a sudden it's like magic wands being waved all over the place. And all of a sudden it's angel dust sprinkled everywhere and everything's fantastic. And the reality of it is, is that's not the case, right? And again, I think sometimes I spend a lot of time talking to clients and we're not talking necessarily about the performance of ads and everything else. It's like, again, it'll be a, a, a sort of change or a pivot in terms of, you know, landing page design, mobile first, all that type of stuff. Again, the, the types of ads that you may have, again, Meta will be pushing very heavily things like reels and, and stuff like that. And again, if you haven't got a good strategy for it, I yeah. think it, it, again, it frustrates me a little bit because you, if you go on to Instagram and places like that, You'll see everyone's talking about, you got to get your message across. The hook's got to be in the first two to two to five seconds, blah, blah, blah. And I get that. But sometimes, depending on what type of product you're selling, it's not this fast paced, stack them high, sell them cheap product that you're selling. If yeah. you know the storytelling needs to be more complex, right? That doesn't lend itself to that two to five second kind of fast paced right. jump cut type, type ad copy, right? It, exactly. it tends to be much more. Especially as you get into like B2B engagements too, your sales cycle could be months or years, right? So yeah. I did a presentation at the last conference that we were at and it was, had a lot to do with B2B lead gen and how to find success for companies that are selling software or, or SaaS products or things like that. And, and the first like three to five slides I have are all about content strategy, nothing at all to do with ads whatsoever. So. It's a much, it's now a much broader project, right? Like, cause if you don't have good content, your ad campaigns aren't going to work on LinkedIn or anywhere else. It's just, there's so many foundational things that need to be in place for the media to work properly. And there's so much less margin for error in the media markets. Now the auctions are so impacted that you really have to have everything lined up correctly to make any money doing this, right? It's, it's, it's absolutely required. So when you get somebody out there like who says, oh, let's throw some ads out there and let's sell some products. It doesn't work like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, I get horribly frustrated when I see people are doing it because they're trying to, again, they're trying to hook people into their content, but they're, they keep talking about hacks and tricks. And it's like, there, there are no hacks. There are no, if you have to trick people into doing something, then in my view, they, they, you fail. I mean, there's, yeah. they're, they're there really are no hacks. There's no tricks. There's just, there's a, there's a logical way to arrive at what the strategy should be to deliver the, the results that you want. And, and not, again, there's nothing that, that is being done now by any advertiser on any platform that is a, a kind of a hack that is a you know, backdoor into some other piece of the algorithm. No, there's, yeah, has, there's no, access, yeah, there's no, exist. yeah, there's no ha reverse engineering the algorithm. Like that's a waste of time. I mean, you've, You'd much rather focus on like, how do I increase my conversion rate? Like, or how do I increase my engagement rate with my ads? I got a, a great one though. And these are the things you can pick up like in B2B gift cards. Apparently gift cards work really well. We found this out with one of our clients almost by mistake. Hey, if you want to get somebody to download a piece of content or show up to a webinar or otherwise engage with your brand, throw them a $50 gift card. And in your, if your, if your cost per lead target is $300, well, now it's two fifty dollars plus your $50 gift card. Right. And if, and if it nets out to a, 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 an all in lower cost per acquisition, that's, that's like what tips and tricks are these days. It's not, it's not tricking yeah. the algorithm. It's not like to your point, there's, there's not really any shortcuts. It's just being, being smart marketers, being good marketers. We always yeah. talk about, yeah. this, um, unfair value exchange, right? The, the notion that whether you're in B2B or B2C, that you always have to be delivering more value to your client or prospect than they're giving you, right? And you have to maintain that not only during the sales cycle, but also throughout your entire, your entire tenure that they're your client. You always have to be giving them more. And the more unfair that exchange is, the better for, for marketers. So the more you can just over deliver with value relative to what you're asking for, the better off you're going to be. And, and a lot of people just lose sight of that. They're like, well, why aren't people signing up? Why aren't people yeah. converting? It's like, well, why should they? Why have, 
if we spelled it out to them that they're going to get more in value than they're going to give to us, right? So there's some really yeah. basic principles at play here on a very, very complex landscape. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've been working with, with Microsoft advertising for a long, long time, right? From, from probably long before they changed their name to Bing or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. again, I don't even know what they MSN. call Microsoft advertising now. Remember, MSN, we whatever. Yeah. be able to buy like keywords on MSN. Yeah. And, and again, it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, but, but so, so, so for me, it was always one of those things. Like I re always remember the rep from Microsoft would ask for a testimonial and we got great results on Microsoft because everyone was like poo-pooing Microsoft. Oh, it's crap. It's, there's no traffic. There's no volume, blah, blah, blah. Well, right. And the reality of it was, is that it actually performed incredibly well, right? I don't think it's necessarily as good as it is, as it used to be. I think because they're trying to be more like Google, right? And I, again, I think that's the, probably the biggest mistake they made, right? They tried to be more like Google rather than more Microsoft that they, that, that would have been a, probably a better play, but they're always saying to me, can you give us a testimonial? And I'm like, no. And they would say, well, don't you think the service is great and the, the results are good? I'm like, yeah, the service is great. The results are fantastic. But if I tell people about that in a testimonial, all of a sudden they'll have far more competition. I don't want to tell people about it. And that's always one of the challenges when you do good work for people, right? Is yes, you want them to tell other people about it, but at the same time, they don't want to do that because it then means that potentially they could have 10 more competitors, right? Because nine other companies that, that work in the same vertical that they work in say, well, oh, they've done that great work for that, that company. I'm, I'm in the same vertical. I'm going to hire that agency. Right. And it's always, a, again, it's a bit of a double edged sword, the, the kind of the whole referral recommendation kind of model. Yeah. And we, we came up through this auction marketplace for ads, and it's a brand new concept, right? Ads had never been purchased that way before. And so a lot of people don't really understand even what that means. I still find that we really have to sit clients down and talk to them about, like, here's what's happening to your search impression share. And here, our competitors that are coming in and here's why your results need to be better uh, because we need to be more aggressive in the auction and Amazon's pushing us out or whoever. So Dave, in, in the next three to five years, what are you concerned about and what, what opportunities do you see ahead? Yeah, well, so as far as concerns go, I think you've alluded to some of them where there's a lot of, there's a lot of consolidation in the industry. There's a lot of people who are going in house. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to reach out like we've always done, like more towards the cutting edge. And so I think that more so than ever before, you have to have a point of view on Gen AI and how we use it. So there's, we have to spend time like really thinking about that, ironing out our process. Like, okay, for us as an agency, Gen AI is about efficiency and it's about ideation and iteration. And so it allows us to be more creative and more efficient It'll make your client, your make your dollars go further. We're doing more than our competition is. So we've been doing it longer. So there's a lot of just refining the process and the message uh, and the product too. Like coming out of PubCon the uh, last couple of weeks, I've seen some demos from some of the folks that we both know really amazing stuff, like really, really great workflow automation tools, leveraging AI. So I think that's where a ton of the opportunity is, is, and it's like we've talked about, like in, in our industry, low barrier to entry. So it's, I don't have to outrun the lion. I just have to outrun you. So that's what the agency game is a lot about. It's, a, it's just about like being faster and smarter than our competition. And so that doesn't change, but what makes you smarter and faster is definitely changing. So that's both where the challenge and the opportunity lie, I think. I don't know. I don't think I coined the phrase, but I've, I've, I've adopted the phrase as being part of the business. But really, I mean, I think we're moving into more of being a consultancy, yeah. right? Because again, I think if people want to take things in-house, I, I, for whatever reason, I mean, again, there are some benefits of taking things in-house and I think there's some yeah. things that will be detrimental. And for me, I think that a lot of the the det detrimental pieces that they're missing out on the cutting edge kind of stuff. Yeah. And again, practitioners like you and I that are living and breathing it every day, we'll understand things at a far more granular level than people that work in-house for one company. 
They well, just they work in their island, our right? Business, we're exposed to a lot more data. So if our client is interested in advertising on TikTok, which is brand new, we've got 10 clients on TikTok. We can bring a lot more data to the party than our clients can. Even if they think they know TikTok advertising, like we're doing a lot more of it than they are. So so that's always going to be a good reason to to go with an agency is when you're thinking about like, how do I handle this new thing? Like agencies are good with that because they see a lot of the new thing because everyone wants the new thing. So I believe there's always reasons to use an agency. But to your point, now it's not just for blocking and tackling. It's for higher thinking. It's for it's for better workflow. It's for better efficiency, more creativity. These are reasons that you want to work with an agency. It's not because you just need somebody to work the Google ads machine, right? A lot of that stuff, if you set it up, so we do a lot more work in architect, like search architecture gets a lot more attention than execution. The execution is now being handled more by machines. So strategy set up, everything you do above that in the funnel and below that, that's where we can add value. And that's where we do. It's and it make and you and you make it look simple, but it's really not simple. I think that's the that's the the kind of the challenge sometimes. Could people go they 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 may be concerned about how can you justify what you're charging for what you're delivering, right? Because they might think, well, you haven't done any changes. It's like, well, I didn't need to make any changes. And again, it's that whole thing of knowing when to do things right. and when not to do things. Sometimes not right? doing sometimes something it, is the best decision, right? You can get yeah. into this into this place where you're making changes every couple of days and it's a spiral, right? Like you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to make some changes and then observe what happens and then make some more changes. And that's, that's how the business works. It's not, there's no one recipe either, especially all these campaigns are changing so rapidly. Like if you think about like even Google performance max campaigns, there isn't a single playbook for performance max across clients or even within the same vertical, there's no playbook because the campaigns themselves are changing so rapidly. So whatever you were doing that worked yesterday may not work tomorrow and vice versa. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of horsepower, a lot of resourcing that goes into like, how do we set up seven different performance max configurations so that we can figure out which one works for this specific client. And that's complicated stuff. And it's not to your point, it's behind the scenes. Nobody sees it. But when you can get the the new campaign types to work, that's how you earn your money. Yeah, and 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 I think when you look at the the origins of Pmax, it, it used to be people would do standard shopping. Some people would do Google Display Network campaigns. Some would try YouTube, and quite often people would try them, fail miserably, and just stop doing them. Right, mm-hmm. and that obviously hurts Google's bottom line. Right, so they almost like they force people into this corner of saying. You're going to do Pmax. You're going to get all this stuff. You need to upload videos. You need to do display campaigns. Blah blah blah. Right? Because because ultimately they want to have people not opting out of anything. Right? It should, they don't want to kind of like give you the option of saying, well, you know what? Instead of advertising all twenty five thousand of my products, I'm only going to advertise ten of them because they're the ones that give me the most money. Right? That gives them the least money. Gives me the most money. That's not good for for Google because. You know, ultimately, they they want you to make profit, but not so much profit that it's bad for them. So, and again, I, I think I think sometimes that that's the the again trying to understand the adoption of and something new when it comes out. It'll come with some limitations, things that worked maybe before that you don't have access to now. We've always looked back and gone, oh, I wish I could do this. Wish you could do this. You can't. Got to move on. It's not there anymore. You've got to just keep looking forward, not looking backwards. Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap things up. It's been fantastic to have you on as a guest. I'd love to have you on again because we didn't really get into too many we, of the, the got, There's the really a lot bad of bad decisions. decisions. That we, there's some really uh, bad decisions uh, that we haven't talked about yet. So hopefully we get to uh, do this again sometime. Absolutely. And and yeah, I mean, again, I've, I've loved having you on the show. Obviously, all of Dave's information, contact details will be in the show notes and they'll be on the page on the website that will be uploaded when this episode goes live it only remains me to say thanks a lot for being on the show thanks for being a friend and we'll talk to you on the next episode of bad decisions with jim banks awesome thanks jim it's been a real pleasure